Hey everyone, it's uh, David Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, the blog site, YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, now Amazon podcast, where I talk about buying, selling, managing, and financing small and medium-sized enterprises. Today, I've got a really special guest. Uh, Sam Ambo is uh, joining me today. And I met Sam just recently. Um, he was referred to me by a, a common acquaintance um, here in my local business community. And I was speaking with Sam for a little while and uh, Sam's got a background in private equity um, up in Toronto. And I've had a couple of videos in the last year talk about lower mid-market and mid-market deals. And I knew that he would be a great guest to have on the show to talk about the private equity environment and doing business in mid-market deals. And so Sam, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, David. I'm well, how are you? I'm doing great. Um, why don't we start off by having you talk a little bit about some of the background and experience uh, that you know has led you to the point that you're at today? Sure. Um, some of the some of the um, companies that you worked with in Toronto and and some of the types of deals that you were working on when you were with them. Great, yeah. So I, I kind of started my career um, in investment banking with with CIBC World Markets. Um, started in Toronto, uh, spent some time in Calgary, but kind of really spent the bulk of my, my investment making career in Toronto. Um, was focused on, on at that time, doing uh, M&A deals and equity financing in the power and utilities slash infrastructure space, mm -hmm. um, really across, across North America, but traditionally doing just bigger deals, given that um, you know, those projects are, are high capital costs, just making the, the size of the companies that you deal with quite large. Um, and then 2016 um, switched to Torcross Partners, which is you know, one of Canada's um, first uh, mid-market private equity funds based in Toronto, um, investing in companies across North America. The current fund is a uh, Torcross Fund 5, is a $1.4 billion um, Canadian mm -hmm. fund investing in, uh, again, all types of industries, but size bracket being kind of call it 10 million, 15 million in EBITDA and up, um, and, and really focusing on being the first institutional capital into transactions. So really focused on buying businesses from successful owners and entrepreneurs um, when it's time for them to exit. So you said something there that I'd like to, I'd like to just backtrack a little bit on sure. because I think it, it was a little bit of a educational insight for the, for the people in the audience. You said that they were on fund number five. And a lot of the times when people think about these private equity groups and stuff, they don't really think for a moment about how these organizations are, are structured. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but typically what happens is a private equity group will create a fund. They'll raise money, put money in the fund. Yep. That basket of money then becomes, um, you know, sort of closed off. They, you buy and sell companies, et cetera. And there's a, some kind of end or termination plan for that fund. Yes. So that people know when they put money in, this is like a 10 year commitment, for example, that I'm making or a five year commitment, what have you. And then as that money gets used up, then they start to another fund. And then now we've got basket number two. And eventually as basket number one reaches its expiry date, some of those assets could actually be bought by some of the future funds, correct? Yeah, I would say that that doesn't happen so often anymore just because there's a bit of a conflict if mm. some of the investors are in both funds, but then, you know, not necessarily in the other, but yeah, exactly on pricing. It has happened in the past for sure. And, and it, it kind of, um, it, it does happen in the U S but I, I would say generally speaking as funds mature, they kind of look to sell, to sell elsewhere, um, would kind of be at a, at a high level of model. But just to give you an example, when I joined TorQuest, um, my employment letter was with TorQuest fund four. So as an investment professional, um, I worked for Fund 4. And if Fund 4 were to be TorQuest or would have been TorQuest's final fund, that would have been the end of my, my employment. Um, so uh, for the fund to keep going or the, the investment manager to keep going, they continuously need to raise new funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so Fund 5 was, was uh, completed in March. Um, my employment letter, I believe, transferred over. But... We still had at the time parallel investments in both funds, uh, I guess all three funds, funds three, four, and five, um, kind of on the go at the same time, investing into fund five, I should say. So and, and by parallel investments, you mean that there could have been an acquisition opportunity that more than one fund participated in? 
Uh, less that meant more just to, that uh, Fund 5 would have been where we were doing the new acquisitions, okay. but we still had uh, operating businesses in both funds. Well, I get you. And four. Okay. So, so let's talk a little bit about the types of businesses that you were trying to look for. Um, what would be some of the parameters that would, would, that would characterize on average what a company would have to be in order for you to be interested? Um, so at a high level size was kind of the, the first uh, hurdle that a business would have to kind of meet. So Canadian mid-market size, again, $10 million of EBITDA at the low end um, and call it 70 million at the high end. And at that point, you kind of need to do uh, deals with partners. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the general kind of first criteria um, and geography would really be the other. Our, our focus was, you know, primarily Canada, but we had multiple investments in the U.S. Um, initially, the fund was meant to be very industry agnostic. So we had investments in heavy industrial businesses, um, transportation businesses, um, chemical um, uh, manufacturing distribution businesses. Um, but towards the end of fund um, four, we had kind of broadened the spectrum to go into a little bit more retail type investments. So we had an investment in the retail pharmacy space in Western Canada, then a um, direct to consumer online furniture manufacturing business. Um, and then kind of most notably the, uh, the A&W Burger franchise was also uh, one of Torquest investments. So a bit of a mix, um, but in terms of criteria, it was, it was really focused First and foremost, on uh, healthy recurring cash flow is kind of the underpinning of, of all the investment thesis, um, thesis that Torquest would, would look at. Um, and then beyond that, it could really be a, a wide spectrum of business parameters that would, would fit the, the kind of um, right mold, again, with the objective of, of targeting returns north of 20% IRRs for investors. Yeah. So, so the whole idea here is that you go looking for things that the average investor just can't find. So uh, this is the reason why people with money uh, who meet certain qualifications like accredited investors and things like this are going to come and give that money to you guys. Now, you mentioned doing deals with partners when they get onto the bigger side. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of private equity ecosystem? You know, because there's sure. a lot of these different companies and then you interact with different sorts of sources of money, like family offices and stuff like that. Can you speak to that for a little bit? Sure. So I would say on the, for a tour request, um, say Canadian uh, mid-market private equity fund. Um, and I would, I would caveat that it's a privately held fund. Um, Onyxes of the world have publicly traded vehicles and those are a little bit more complicated, but I'll park those for now. Um, Torquest, um, Torquest investor group was kind of a, a broad mix of, of sources. Um, on one end of the spectrum, you had the, the large Canadian pension funds. So the pension funds themselves have the ability to invest directly in private equity deals, like acquire companies themselves, but they just have so much capital and they, they, it, it's limiting to them. So they need to kind of put it with uh, asset managers such as, as Torquest. Um, Torquest had a lot of investment from endowments, um, university endowments, Mm -hmm. um, hospital endowments across Canada and the US. Um, some private individuals and in, in high net worth folks, but a little bit less just given the fund size. Um, and you're really talking, you know, minimum uh, investment sizes of $10 million plus. Um, and that's probably even on the low end. And then uh, finally, the family offices. So family offices really being kind of the, the universe of ultra high net worth individuals that have dedicated um, teams to help deploy their capital and, and probably in most instances, multiple investments in different private equity funds. Okay. So the, the reason why I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about how, you know, even TorQuest given this large size and the amount of money that had available, even TorQuest sometimes had to go and find other people to put in money uh, to make a deal happen. Yep. And um, you know, your new company is called High Tide Capital uh, here in Atlantic Canada. And um, one of the big topics of discussion that's been happening in different online communities that I'm part of is that there are an increasing number of people out there calling themselves, you know, capital, capital partners, all this kind of stuff on their websites. And there are people who don't have the money to do deals and they don't necessarily have any experience to do deals. And I'm just wondering, if I'm a business owner 
and uh, I've got 10, $15 million of revenue and I'm maybe got an EBITDA of a million bucks or something. Sure. And these different people that look like private equity funds keep knocking on my door. Right. How do I know if someone really is someone that I should be talking with or not? Right. Um, yeah. And you raise a good point. Like anyone can put up a website. There's no real barrier to doing that. Um, so I'd say first and foremost is just doing diligence on the individual. Um, you know, a good starting point is LinkedIn kind of trying to get a sense of their background. Um, mm. you know, traditionally you'll see, um, folks having either an investment banking or hedge fund kind of type background and then kind of eventually into another private equity firm, um, would be kind of step number one. Step number two is when you speak to them, kind of get, you know, a sense of what their experience is and what they did at their prior firms. Um, the types of investments they were doing with the, the industries um, and, and kind of structurally what their role was. Um, I think you can kind of start sniffing out a liar and that, and that stuff pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I know somebody that's really good at kind of the, 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 the face um, of it. So I would, you know, suggest you can, you can even have that person provide a, a proof of capital reference. Um, so in my case, there's investors in our, my group that, um, are able to speak on my behalf and speak to the ability of, of the fund to fund acquisitions. I think that's a really good um, kind of final test. Um, if you if you do have your doubts, the one thing I would say, however, is um, you know as many of those um, guys running around that have no ability to do transactions but have done kind of the weekend seminar thing, there are you know on the flip side a lot of individuals who are kind of in that that search fund group that. Um, are credible buyers. They're non-traditional. They're growing in in, in terms of um, uh, you know activity level in, in the industry. Um, but you know the, the in some cases individuals that are you know below the age of thirty that um, have kind of gone off and have um, you know right connections and the right folks and, and have um, the ability to circle capital for you know fifty sixty million dollar enterprise deals. Um, are, are out there for sure. So I wouldn't necessarily um, automatically dismiss folks either. I think you kind of just need to do a little bit of diligence to make sure you're dealing with um, with somebody that, you know, the capital is one piece, but more more importantly, I think too, is just the ability to consummate a deal. Um, it's not that easy to do this stuff in practice if you don't have relationships with, with equity investors or the banks to, to even have those discussions is really challenging. Um, and then on the legal side and accounting side, like just actually doing the diligence required is, is complicated stuff. So uh, I think that's actually, you know, a pretty big threat as well is, is not just the person doesn't have the money in hand, but just that they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. So, you know, really what you're saying is that there's no hard and fast, you know, it's like you go into a, a person's office, you see a, 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 you know, a medical degree on the wall from university. You're like, okay, well, this guy's probably a doctor but there's no real certification hard and fast, you know, this is what you need. Check, check, check. It's, it's really caveat emptor and doing, being a little bit skeptical and, and being willing to do some work to try to investigate uh, the person that you might be talking with. Yep. That, that's, that's exactly right. I think, you know, for the most part, I would say if, if you do do that kind of that LinkedIn search and, and kind of see reputable institutions on, on their kind of background, I think, that is a good starting point. Um, at the very least, they have the competency to be able to, to, to do what they're saying they can do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond that, in terms of capital and all that stuff, I think it's born out of discussions with those folks, but there's no, um, you know, there's no CFA equivalent designation that necessarily gives you uh, the kind of comfort in, in how to deal with these folks. Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think those are great points. Um, so now you've, You've moved on from, from Torstar and, and now you are started your own firm. And so what, what exactly are you looking for? Because um, at the private equity group, you were doing analysis and, and doing acquisition, but the running of the day-to-day -day business, there would be some kind of professional manager who would be running those businesses that, that yep. the private equity firm owned. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now, because you're kind of using a little bit of that search fund model in a different way in that you're looking for a business to make an investment and you want to have a more active role in the day-to-day -day management, correct? Yep. And, and kind of just going back to the requesting for one quick sec, sure. um, the role of, of, of um, investment professionals at a private equity firm 
kind of ranges from the initial sourcing of opportunities to evaluation, review, assessment of that opportunity, developing the investment thesis, closing the transaction, and after transaction, um, how involved the private equity firm is in day-to-day -day operations varies quite a bit. Okay. Uh, you know, on a spectrum of one to 10, one being very, very low touch, um, there are a lot of firms in that kind of one end of the spectrum, and that's, you know, often related to how big the businesses that you've invested in are. The bigger they are, the more kind of, uh, you know, standalone they can be, and, and um, the lower touch you can be. So some of those bigger funds are on the lower end. I'd say TorQuest is somewhere in the middle slash middle more involved end, um, where our job wasn't necessarily to run the businesses, but we were um, always at kind of the table with all major decisions and helped management teams navigate um, opportunities and challenges that came their way. Um, so, so kind of what I'm doing now with High Tide is, is a bit of an extension of, of um, private equity firm and, and kind of a search fund model. So it's, it's doing a single acquisition, and in my case, focused on Atlantic Canada and Atlantic Canada only. Mm -hmm. um, and, and looking for you know situations that are call it lower middle market or even lower market um, opportunities that are really businesses in the range of let's say one to five or maybe even one to seven of, of EBITDA. Um, one and, one one to five or one to seven million dollars a year of EBITDA. Yeah, yeah. and um, from a you know situational standpoint, I think the view is. You know, in Atlantic Canada in particular, it's true across Canada, but Atlantic Canada in particular, you have a critical mass of, of small business owners that are um, approaching the age of, of retirement or in some cases are kind of already there um, that have either little or no true succession planning completed. And they're going to be looking to do something with those businesses, whether it's um, try to find a traditional private equity fund or uh, in some cases look to sell to their employees. Um, you know, if there's not necessarily kids in the picture to take over. Um, so they'll really look at a whole bunch of different opportunities um, to exit. In my case, it's a little bit of a different, um, you know, proposition to them. It's uh, a sale of a majority of the stake of their business. So I would, with our group, um, acquire a majority stake in the business um, and help uh, facilitate a transition period over, call it six to 12 months, where I personally would um, step into the business and and mirror that owner operator to learn everything I can about the business over that period of time. Um, inevitably that's, you know, not enough time to learn everything. Mm. Um, some of these folks have been in those businesses for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so it'd be kind of foolish to think that that period of time is enough to really, to really get the full, the, the full debrief. Um, but it's enough to kind of maintain stability of the operation thereafter. And, um, Following the transition period, it's, it's kind of my own, it's, the onus is on me to drive value creation in that business, whether it's grow revenues, um, you know, manage costs, um, invest in different places in the business, go into different markets, acquire competitors. It's really, you know, the, the investors are to me to do that. Um, the original or initial owner operator, um, in most instances, will actually be, uh, remain a, a minority equity investor in the business. So they kind of have the ability to, to kind of stay tied or linked to their business in some way and, and kind of benefit from, from that future growth. Um, but there's no kind of day-to-day -day responsibility on them. They can, uh, you know, go golfing, move to Florida, or just kind of take it easy, whatever the, the kind of next stage of their life is. Um, it's really up to them, but uh, from an ownership and, and management perspective, that's kind of all, all on my shoulders. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting, and, and this is this is what we were speaking about last time when you and I were talking. Is that yep. this part of your process kind of mirrors uh, more the Main Street business space that that I work in every day with with different people? In that, sure. um, you know, you have an owner operator, and and they're going to leave, and you're going to come in, and often, you know, in those Main Street deals, the the seller is holding some sort of financing. In this case, you're talking about them holding on to equity, so you face a lot of the same hurdles that a main street business buyer would face in that the business owner has to see in you the, the capability of being able to run the business and that you're going to be coachable and be able to learn what you need to do. But also the fact that you're going to bring some new elements into, into play, which, you know, for, for someone holding a seller financing note, 
Yep. You know, that's a fixed amount of debt. But in this case, what you're describing is the seller is going to still have equity in the business. So if you can grow that business, then potentially their payoff can be even more generous than what they initially, uh, you know, agreed to when you did your first part of the deal. Yeah, ex exactly. And I think what I'm really trying to appeal to is, is, um, you know, entrepreneurs view their businesses as an extension of their family and, and you know, entities that they've invested, you know, years of their lives building and growing. Um, that doesn't just die when they approach the age of retirement, right? Like they're, they're not kind of, you know, I'm, I'm ready to retire. I'm done with this. Like I'm, I'm walking out. Um, what I'm kind of trying to appeal to is, is their desire to continue to see their business grow and their brand kind of expand and get stronger um, and kind of, you know, come along for the ride as well. Um, so a little bit of a different structure to it. Um, you know, in some cases there may also be a vendor take back component and the equity piece would be a little bit smaller, but um, I do think some type of minority equity interest is, is not only, you know, in my best interest, because evidently having that person linked to the business is important, but I think a lot of times some of these folks actually want that. Um, I do think there's an emotional aspect to all this stuff. And I think um, it gives them, uh, you know, a sense of pride to remain invested in their businesses and kind of see them continue to grow. Well, yeah. and it, you know, it would probably help with the, the, you know, the interests of, you know, other partners who you bring in um, to be shareholders as well, be, knowing that there's always long-term access to the original owner, um, just for the sake of being able to talk to them and ask questions and, and get little exactly. pieces of history that might become relevant uh, moving forward. Yeah, exactly. A, a big part of that minority interest piece is to have that kind of, um, you know, bridge or, or access to that person in terms of maintaining dialogue and, and kind of bouncing ideas off of them or, or kind of having them feel like they um, still have a voice and if they have an idea or see something that I should pursue that they, it's kind of an open communication channel mm -hmm. uh, absolutely and I think you know even in, in practical terms um, when you do a transaction for these businesses you know a lot of the times employees or customers or other folks can be you know a bit worried about okay, what does this change mean for me? And, and how does this kind of affect my relationship with this company going forward? And the ability to say, listen, you know, person X, Y, Z is still a shareholder in this business. They're, you know, now kind of taking a, a step back and, and being less involved, um, you know, is an obvious thing, but they're, they're still invested and the business is going to continue to be run under their kind of values and, and, and all that stuff. I think means a lot to a lot of these, these individuals, both on the, employee and, and customer side. So I think there's also, you know, true business value to, to maintaining that, that relationship. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. I would agree. Um, why don't you let everyone know what your website is and, um, and, and when I'll, I'll thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's uh, hightidecapital.ca. tide um, has a bit of information on me and, and the types of opportunities we're, we're looking for, but again, it's, it's entirely focused on Atlantic Canada. Um, so always welcome kind of emails or, or introductions um, or referrals. Um, so feel free to kind of get in touch with, we, with me through the website or, or my LinkedIn page. Awesome. So on the YouTube, uh, in the YouTube show notes, if you're watching this video on YouTube down below, I'll put the link to Sam's website and the link to his uh, LinkedIn profile. Um, and I'll remind everyone, if you've enjoyed this interview, please hit the like button. It's very important for the YouTube algorithm to help promote the visibility of the show. And if you wanna make sure that you never miss any one of these interviews or any of the other videos that I make, be sure to sign up for my email list. Uh, you get to pick which topics are interesting to you. So you only get emails on those topics. And you can find that over at davidcbarnett.com. There's a sign up there or directly at davidcbarnettlist.com. It's just the sign up page. And with that, we'll say thank you very much, Sam. And uh, thanks for everyone who's been watching and we'll see you next time. Thanks.